Okay, so I'll uh, go straight into it because I tend to go over time and I might as well compensate by not bothering with introductions. So what is proof of stake? So proof of stake was um, originally pioneered in uh, 2011, 2012. The first sort of major cryptocurrency that proof of stake uh, started to become well known inside was called PeerCoin. These days, many versions exist. There's NXT, Tendermint, Flying Fox, a bunch of other algorithms. And the primary purpose of this is to uh, solve the yeah, wasted electricity problem. So basically, in proof of work, you have a network consisting of many thousands of computers. And each one of these computers consumes a very, very large amount of energy. So in, uh, the, ca in the case of Bitcoin, the amount is somewhere um, on the order of, I believe, a couple of million dollars a day. Someone um, did a calculation, and it was either half as much or exactly as much as the electricity consumption of Ireland. In the case of Ethereum, it's about $360,000 a day. It's a bit less, basically, because the market value of Ethereum is, of uh, Ether is a bit less, and there's the, the ecosystem is kind of a bit small, or the, the network is a bit smaller. But in general, proof of work as a form of consensus does consume a large amount of power. It kills trees, and this is perceived by some as being not very nice. So the uh, intuition behind proof of stake is this concept of virtual mining. So you can think of it this way. In proof of work, you have $1,000. You use your $1,000 to buy a miner. You turn on the miner, and the miner starts generating blocks. And this is a random process. Maybe one day you're going to generate four blocks, the next day you'll generate zero blocks, the third day you'll generate zero blocks, the fourth day you'll generate zero blocks, you'll wonder if there's a bug, and the fifth day you'll generate two blocks again. Um, in proof of stake, similar process. You have $1,000, you use the $1,000 to buy 83 Ether, and there is a rule in the protocol that says that you can convert the 83 Ether into a virtual miner. And while you have the virtual miner, the protocol itself assigns you randomly the right to create blocks from time to time. So in, now, because these miners are virtual, there needs to be some way to keep track of uh, which miners exist, which miners have been created. So in Casper, we have this, uh, no, or which is um, the proof of stake algorithm that myself, Vlad, and other people have been working on. There is this uh, notion of a Casper contract. So basically, we use a contract inside of Ethereum to keep track of all of the information that's kind of relevant to the state of Ethereum's consensus. So what information do we need to keep track of? Well, the first one is the set of bonded validators. So we can think of bonded validators as basically being the set of virtual miners that have been activated. Now, the reason why I call them bonds is because one nice thing that you can do in proof of stake is you can actually have the conversion be two-way. You can take your 83 Ether, convert it into a virtual miner, mine for a bit, and when you're tired of mining, you can take your miner and convert it back into Ether, plus rewards minus penalties. So in, in the state, there's a set of bonded validators. So basically, the set of people who, that have taken their Ether and convert, be, can put it into these uh, Casper bonds. And one person might have put in 50 Ether, one person might have put in 500 Ether, one person might have put in 17,300 Ether. Stay keep, the Casper contract keeps track of all of this. And the contract has a deposit function. So if you have Ether, then you can call this deposit function and you can send a bit of Ether along with the call and you get registered as a validator. If this call is made during like, some particular epoch, then basically within uh, 12 to 24 hours, your miner activates. Now, there are reasons why you, we need to have this sort of fairly long activation time. It has to do with the like client friendliness, but I won't go into it right now. So we have this uh, set, of set of validators. Casper contract keeps track of the set of validators. Now, who makes these blocks? So basically, there is a yeah, mechanism inside of the protocol that uh, generates, uh, basically, pseudo-randomly determines what the next, a sequence of validators that is going to be eligible to create the next block. So if you have a blockchain and the blockchain has gone up to some point, so let's say there's some current head, that's let's say block 5,000, then the uh, 
protocol generates the sequence of validators and it says this validator is going to be eligible to make block 5001 in four seconds. Then this validator is going to be eligible to make block 5001 in 12 seconds. This validator is going to be eligible to make 5, block 5001 in 20 seconds and so forth. Now normally we expect that validators are going to be online most of the time. And so most of the time the zero skip validator is the one that actually ends up creating the block. Some of the time that validator is offline. So in that case, you have to deal, you have to basically skip over them and the next validator can create the block instead. So now question, one question is where does this kind of randomness come from? And uh, the, uh, now this actually is a uh, kind of fairly important piece of proof of stake economics, but basically there are a lot of bad ways of doing it. And there are some fair, uh, fairly good ways of doing it. So the approach that Casper uses us right now is basically that every single block, when you call the deposit function, you basically have to commit to the end of a big, of a, basically a long chain of hashes. And every time you make a block, you kind of reveal, a you re reveal the previous value from your chain, and this becomes a source of random, uh, part of the source of random data. And in order, what you do in, in order to figure out the sort of random seed from which you get your validator sequence is you kind of XOR all of the all of this data that gets provided by the validators together. So this that's kind of a very rough uh, rough description. But the uh, general principle though is that uh, the uh, basically that you're combining together data from the the all of these validators which theoretically exists in the network, but which doesn't actually get revealed until the block gets created. And when, when, it's your turn to, when it's your turn to create a block, you don't have a choice of which value you're revealing because you're already committed to it. Now, of course, you do have the, the possibility of not creating a block. So that's the only way in which you can kind of manipulate the randomness. But the idea is that if you do that, that if you voluntarily don't publish a block, then that's going to cost you a lot of money. And so the portion of the time when it actually does make sense for you to try to manipulate the randomness by doing that is very small. Now, there is one other approach involving threshold signatures. And if you want someone who is very good at talking about that, you'll probably want to try and talk to Dominic Williams at some point. He is around, though unfortunately doesn't seem to be around right now. But that's, um, in, in general, there's, um, what, this is like one of the sort of fine points of, of fine points of any kind of blockchain like proof of stake protocol, how to select the next validator. And it's, uh, it's been fairly, act, uh, I would say fairly actively researched for a few years. There are, there are, as I was saying, there were a lot of kind of earlier protocols that did, that weren't very good at it. So a lot of earlier protocols had flaws where basically if you had computing power, you could sort of generate an address, like an address, move your coins to that address and constantly get an advantage over everyone else. Um, but the recent approaches the, uh, tends to uh, solve all of those problems. So as I said, validators can't just deposit, validators can also withdraw. So if you're a validator, then you, or if you, have, you had ether, then you became a validator, then you, uh, produce blocks for a bit and you're tired of producing blocks, you can call the withdrawal function and within 12 to 24 hours your validator deactivates. Then you have to wait a bit longer and at some point after your validator deactivates you have the ability to withdraw. And then uh, you basically get the ether back that you put in and if you got any block rewards you get those too. And the Casper contract also has some cases in which it penalizes you and if you get penalized then the amount of ether you get back is subtracted. So one of the yeah, main uh, sort of problems with a lot of earlier proof of stake algorithms is this concept of nothing at stake. So the um, general way that I think about it, they think about it as this. In proof of work, you generally have, if you have two competing chains, then you have four choices. One of them is that you don't mine. One of them is that you mine on chain A. One of them is that you mine on chain B. And one of them is that you basically split half and half. Now, there are a lot of options in between, but those are kind of linear combinations. So we can basically only care about these four. Now, 
let's say that you per, that you personally think that chain A is the one the chain that has a ninety percent chance of being of uh, being the chain that everyone converges on later on, and you think that chain B is the chain that everyone has a ten percent uh, chance of converging on later on. Let's say the block rewards one. If you mine on chain A, your expected value is basically, well, 1 times 90%, 0.9. Mine on chain B, it's 0.1. And if you split half and half, then you've got half, half your mining power on one side, half on the other, and you get the average. Even still, obviously, the best course of action for you is uh, just stick to one chain. And, and that one chain is the chain that you expect to win. So this is nice, and this is convergent, because everyone has an incentive to mine on the chain that they think is going to win, and therefore that chain actually does end up winning. So this is um, a really great piece of economics, and it does ha have these nice properties, and we've seen empirically that it works well. Now, here is the problem with naive proof-of-stake algorithms. So this includes PeerCoin, it includes like a, um, uh, some of the other older ones, um, does not include Casper. So problem is with proof-of-stake, is that you don't have, is that this, the miners, the virtual miners are themselves maintained by the network. Or, and they are part of the blockchain state. And so if there are two chains, then basically you have a virtual miner on chain A and a virtual miner on chain B. If the chain splits in half, your virtual miner also splits in half. And so your optimal strategy is actually that the virtual miner on chain A mines on chain A and the virtual miner on chain B mines on chain B. Now, this is bad because if everyone does this, then every chain will grow and there will never be any consensus. So in Casper, we have this concept that, we, or, uh, the, that I call dunkles. Um, there's uh, a fairly called So in Ethereum 1.0, there's this concept called uncles that I won't go into uh, too deeply. And, uh, but basically, uncles are like a way of, uh, in, in Ethereum, are a way of getting some portion of your mining reward, even if your block doesn't make it into the main chain. In the case of proof of stake, we, or Casper, we have uncles, but instead of uh, these uncles benefiting you, these uncles hurt you. So what this means is that if, for example, you decide that you're going to make a block on chain B, and it turns out that chain A wins, then your block on chain B actually could be re-included into chain A, and you actually get penalized for this. If you create a block and the block is, not, is part of the main chain, you get a reward. If it's not part of the main chain, you get a penalty. Now, dunkles, dark uncles, because they're kind of like uncles, but they hurt you. And also, a dunkel is the German word for dark, as I understand. So it's uh, a pretty good coincidence. Um, anyway. <laughs> So this is kind of, that was kind of the this piece is sort of the basic uh, intuition behind how Casper tries to achieve um, economics that are actually fairly similar to proof of work in terms of, uh, in terms of how they operate. Um, now, next part is uh, sharding. So Casper, yay, it saves trees, um, makes blocks a bit faster, has some other nice properties, but we also want to try to increase scalability. So the goal here is basically that achieve on-chain scaling to Visa scale or potentially more, hope maybe even IoT scale. But we could do this the easy way, which is that we just stick the entire blockchain in a, in a data center. But we want to keep the thing decentralized. So what we're going to do is, instead of sticking the entire chain in a data center, we want, it, we want the blockchain to ideally be able to run on nothing but consumer laptops. Now, this, isn't, this, this doesn't mean that if that a lot of Casper validators end up running on things other than consumer laptops as the system failed. It means that if it needed to, theoretically it could. Obviously, there's going to be, a, if there are very rich validators, they're probably going to end up just like getting, creating their own data centers, just like we have special, specialized miners now as well. But uh, the, now, how do we accomplish this though? If, let's say, each computer can only process about 50 to 200 transactions a second, but we want the network to process 20,000 transactions a second, how do we do this? The answer is that every single node in the network only keeps track of a small portion of transactions, only keeps track of a small portion of the state, only verifies a small portion of transactions. But if it, if it wants to verify something else, then it can do it with Merkle proofs. So basically, the exact same mechanism that like clients in Ethereum, like clients in Bitcoin use today. Now, shards, think of each shard as being kind of like an independent blockchain. 
but um, which, uh, and I'm deliberately using sort of analogies that make, the short, make short of Ethereum sound like the European Union here, but uh, bear with me. Um, number one, they share security. So basically, one of the problems with shards that you might think of is if you have a blockchain and the blockchain is split into a thousand shards, then, well, each shard only has a thousand as, as many validators behind it. So doesn't that mean that each one of the shards is extremely easy to attack? And the answer is no, because they share security. And we'll get into that later. Number two, common market. So this is the other sort of difference between sharded Ethereum and Yale. Yeah, let's just have a thousand different blockchains. Number one, Ether, you can move it between the two, and, or between like any shard and any other shard. And in general, there is a high level of support for kind of highly efficient cross-shard communications. Um, policy harmonization, so every shard has the same, has, uh, the same EVM, has the same rules, has, a, has uh, the same um, g types of things that you can do on top of it. But they are kind of independent in that, for example, gas prices might be higher on one shard than another shard. So it might be the case that some shards have lots of activity on them, and this means that there might be like a, it, it might make sense for applications that need to synchronously communicate with lots of other contracts to be on those shards, but gas prices on that shard might be higher. Or there might be some shards that are only used by a few applications at some particular time, and uh, trans if transaction fees on those shards are going to be lower. So this is okay. So sampling. So this is actually the mechanism by which we uh, actually uh, manage to uh, kind of share security without forcing everyone to validate everything. So basically what we do is every single epoch, so basically like twice a day, we pseudo randomly select 100 validators to validate each shard. So we say these 100 people that we randomly select go to shard one, these 100 validators that we randomly select go to shard two, these 100 validators we randomly select go to shard three, and so forth. Now, why do we do this? The answer is basically to get around this problem that it sounds as though if you have each uh, many shards, each one only, uh, it will necessarily have to be very insecure. So the problem is, let's say, for example, you have 10,000 total validators, and let's say that you have an attacker so let's say there's some attacker, and that attacker um, has, let's say, 5% of all the validators. And let's say that attack, if we did not do this, then that attacker might be able to concentrate their stake power on five shards and basically take over five of them, do 51% 51, 51 attacks on five of them, and so forth. Now, what we do, because validators are randomly sampled, the attacker has no choice of which shards they go into. So the attacker might decide um, to might try to concentrate their uh, a, a stake on one shard, but because the process is done by this protocol based off of uh, pseudo random information, which is not even available when the attacker commits to uh, depo depositing their stake, the attacker has no way of doing this. What's going to realistically happen is basically that the attacker will just end up with somewhere between like zero and ten percent of the stake on every single shard, and it's spread around evenly, and so there's, they're not going to be able to do that much on, every single sh on any single shard. So the, um, how do we do cross-shard communication? Now, in general, the um, approach in a single shard is basically that you have a state. So there's this notion of the state, which, keeps tr which is like account balances, code, storage, all the information that Ethereum, that Ethereum on the blockchain keeps track of, then you have a block, and you figure out, well, OK, we're going to process the trans every transaction in the block, and we're going to arrive at some new state. In a cross-shard model, instead of what, we, what we're tr trying to do is uh, we're trying to apl apply this across many shards that are not perfectly communicating with each other. And so the model here is, for each shard, we're going to have a state transition function that accepts the state, for that shard, the block for that shard, and some set of previous receipts for all, from all shards. So we're assuming that shards can communicate between each other with, let's say, something like a 12-hour 12 12 time difference. And hopefully, in later versions of the protocol, we'll come up with ways to safely shrink that down. And the idea is that if we allow this time window in between different shards, then base, Basically, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to perform some action on one shard. Then that one action will be able to create this object that's called a receipt. Then 
that you can make a Merkle proof that basically proves that that receipt exists in, in, in that shard, has been committed in that shard. Then it, the validators in every other shard will be able to basically, because, because they're like clients in, in the other shards, they'll be able to see, look in this other shard, this receipt actually does exist. And in other shards, they'll be able to act on it. So that's kind of the basic principle. So in general, you have, uh, we have this, have this principle that information can move between shards to some extent, but it can only move between shards with a kind of fairly long time lag. So this is basically like a, a fairly low amount of cross-shard communication that you can accomplish safely, but at the same time, it is one that does allow you to do um, a lot, quite a lot of things that you're not going to be able to do if you just had, let's say, 80 blockchains that are running in parallel. So the uh, other thing that uh, Christian wanted me to talk a bit about is um, various different uh, bits and pieces of protocol economics. So start off with consensus, who pays for it? So the traditional model that we've seen in uh, Bitcoin land and in a lot of uh, basically like most other uh, proof of work cryptocurrencies is, is this view that in some sense, the desired steady state of a system is for security to be paid for only with transaction fees. So in the case of Bitcoin, we have uh, right now we have block rewards. Block rewards are about 12.5 uh, uh, Bitcoins every block. But these block rewards kind of go down exponentially over time, and eventually the block reward is going to become zero. And the theory is, as uh, was kind of described in the white paper and a bunch of other documents, is that when block rewards disappear, there's going to be a lot of people using the system, and those people will pay transaction fees in order to get included into blocks, and those transaction fees are going to be the incentive for miners to start mining. So the theory is that mining rewards are this kind of only temporary necessary evil to distribute coins and to make the system uh, safe while it's still a young and precious child. And eventually it'll grow up and it'll be able to kind of stand on its own with uh, no new issuance whatsoever. So in my opinion, this model is actually not correct. Uh, two reasons. So one of them is that it's quite possible, now not certain, but quite possible that the level of security is going to be insufficient. So this is just one piece of math, is, and uh, there is a blog article where I do some of these calculations. So in the case of Bitcoin, what uh, Tim Swanson calls a marginal line attack, which is basically literally buying up 51% enough miners to attack the network and just constantly attacking it, should cost around $150 million. Now let's suppose that instead of we right now switch to a model where in, you just have transaction fees. At current levels, it will go down from $150 million to somewhere between $1.2 and $5 million. So it's arguably, $1.2 to $5 million might not be enough because there are plenty of transactions that are much bigger than that. And you might want to be able, uh, you, you ideally want to have a, a higher level of security of security than just 0 0.1, like 0.5% of the market cap of the system. Now, one way that you could increase the level of security is you could basically be, try and force transaction fees to go higher. So you could try and constrain the block size, you could try to basically play around with supply and demand, force uh, the transaction fees to go way up, and see if people are willing to pay five times more. But the problem is that this actually is highly economically inefficient because basically, in order, sure, you're gaining security, but at the same time, you're forcing a lot of people out who um, otherwise might, would still be participating in the system. Now, proof of stake security, I mean, the, the, the theory suggests that it should be cheaper, and it also suggests that it might have better fault recovery. So for example, if someone does pull off a marginal line against proof of stake, you have this really nice sort of last line of defense where basically if someone has 70% of the stake and they're using it to keep on attacking the network, you can just kind of hard fork and delete them. And this sounds heretical, but this is actually a rather cheap way of deleting an attacker. And once you do this once, there are probably, probably no one's actually going to try again. Because be, so, but even still, under conditions where transaction fees are fairly low, this still might not be sufficient. Even still, if transaction fees are you know, something like a few thousand dollars a day some, um, or in that range, even still, it might make sense for someone to try to attack it. So 
might have to, so these are these are concerns and at like at this point it's still very hard to tell but i feel like in general kind of crypto protocol designers should be um will sh should be actively considering the eventuality that fees are just not going to end up being sufficient incentives at least some of the time so here's another interesting problem so there was a, a paper that was uh, published about this one or two days ago i um, I, mean, I wrote a blog post where i brought this up one or two months ago andrew miller talked about it one or two years ago um basically um if you have a model where you have a blockchain and in that blockchain transaction fees are the only incentive then you actually have two choices. If someone makes a block and that block has, let's say, an abnormally high amount of transaction fees, you could mine on top of it, or you could try you could try and make a sister block and you could try and basically steal the transaction fees. So you could try and if someone over here made a block and they included a transaction with five ether as, as fees, you could try and mine on top of it, and you'll get some other fees from you from your transactions, or you can try to basically mine a sister block and and swipe these fees from that from this first block. Now, there are a bunch there are a bunch of like economic arguments around going back and forth. How effective are these strategies going to be? What are the incentives when miners interact with each other? In general, it's like game theoretically very hard and, and like almost intractable. And this figuring out whether or not the system is safe is like a far cry from the kind of simple sort of nine page white paper protocols that we wanted to have. Now, the other problem is also selfish mining. So it turns out that in a transaction fee only model, the amount of hash power that you need to carry out selfish mining attacks also goes down quite a bit. So basically, in general, like the, the sort of principle that behind a lot of these arguments, I feel, is that it's, a lot, it's much easier to do mechanism design when the payoffs of the, in, of the mechanism are under your control. When the payoffs of the, of the mechanism are basically like left to, uh, like in some ways random chance, in some ways like left to actors that themselves have their own that themselves have their own incentives that might conflict with yours, then it's a lot harder to do things. And so it, it's basically the more you, like the further you drift away from having block rewards that are defined by you, the worse. So there actually are interesting ways of potentially dealing with this problem. So here's one of the one of them. So in the traditional model, we uh, talk about the sort of policy space of uh, trying to pay for security is often viewed as being two-dimensional. One of the dimensions of the policy space is what is the block reward? And the other dimension of the policy space is what are the fees? So basically, the fact is you can increase transaction fees by constricting block size or by constricting the gas limit. Now, actually, there's also a third dimension. And the third dimension is fees that are, instead of transaction fees going to miners, the fees get burned. And so these burned fees can be used to pay miners over like a fairly long, or validators over a fairly long schedule. So here's one uh, kind of interesting model. So the uh, blue line over here is actually like real data from uh, Bitcoin fees, uh, thanks to our uh, wonderful, wonderful friends from the uh, Bitcoin toaster company. And uh, the, um, but the, the, uh, the idea here is that if there is some level of transaction fees that you can uh, rely on, that's constantly being paid by like most transactions that are getting into the network, then what you can actually do is you can have the protocol basically commandeer the fees. So what you do is you basically establish an in-protocol mandatory fee. And you say, well, OK. For if a transaction includes some fee, then be, let's say if that fee is uh, something like eight, then if the mandatory fee is six, then the, this mandatory minimum of six goes to, the, goes to the protocol, so it gets burned, and everything above goes as a surplus to the miner. Now, it's actually important to give 100% of the surplus to the miner, because if the marginal reward to the miner like, is less than 100%, then there's actually like, other um, economic attacks that you can, that you can uh, play against this kind of system. But in general, like, as long as you give 100% of the surplus to the miner, then everything below some threshold can basically be sort of taken by the protocol. 
And if it's taken by the protocol, then you can do different things with it. For example, you can use it to pay for a block reward. You can use it to uh, just make sure the supply, that make the supply actually go down over time. So be even more deflationary if you feel like it. Or pay for other thing, um, pay for like some kind of development, that, uh, some kind of DAO that finds protocol development. You can do lots of things. Another interesting approach is you can burn specific classes of fees. So one example is storage fees. So for example, there are, you might want, in your protocol, you might want to charge a fee for creating a new account, for creating a new contract. You might even want to charge rent. You might even want to require every account to pay 0.0001 coins per month that it exists. And there actually are plenty of good reasons to do this. Um, you might want to have fees for creating, uh, accessing kind of higher tiers of storage, where the benefit of higher tiers of storage is that everyone downloads them and uh, even white clients download them and they're very cheap to call. You might want to, in Ethereum, you might want to have fees for polluting the Bloom filter. One general principle is that fees that have to do with either computation or bandwidth should go to miners because miners or validators because miners and validators have a yeah, disincent already have a disincentive to include these kinds of transactions but fees that charge for long-term externalities that have nothing to do with the current validator probably should get burned so so this is another approach and it's one that's probably worth considering and i would actually argue that um, i'll talk about this at the end but Controlling the size, um, making making sure that the size of the state remains small is actually a uh, arguably an, an important policy objective, and it's one that actually probably substantially helps scalability and substan uh, substantially helps uh, uh, with uh, security, DOS attack resistance, and, and lots of things. So keeping uh, also good for sharding. So. In general, like charging storage fees are something that I feel like all proto like new crypt uh, cryptocurrency and protocol designers should very strongly consider. So we have two approaches. So last section, so this is um, how scaling interacts with denial of service attacks. So in Ethereum land, we've had denial of service attacks of various sort of shapes and sizes coming over the last month. And um, in, if we're talking about just a single, sh uh, single chain, one shard, then basically the important thing, it, look, the important consideration in resolving these attacks is basically making sure that there aren't any operations that have a, that have a low cost in terms of gas, but take a large amount of time in order to process. So right now, this is actually, uh, one, one, the uh, major, or we are working on a kind of fairly substantial improvements to, uh, to the Go client that'll make it much faster to read storage. But once that happens, as it turns out, reading and writing from storage is actually one of the uh, uh, dominant, uh, dominant limitations. Now, this actually isn't a problem that Ethereum had before. So this is actually a bit of a combination attack because right up until about two weeks ago, the size of the state in Ethereum was somewhere around like three to 500 megabytes. And what this meant was that basically there were a few attacks that were trying to like do, re, uh, do a huge number of reads of different accounts. But we were able to deal with these attacks because basically we had a cache and we were able to just stick the entire state tree into memory. Well, the problem is there was another attack by which, the, thanks to a protocol flaw, the attacker was able to basically fill the state up to, with about somewhere around 5 to 10 gigabytes worth of empty accounts. And because of this, the state is now too large to hold in RAM entirely, and so the cache has stopped working, and so SSDs actually become a bottleneck. Now, in, the case of, in our case, after the second hard fork comes along, it's uh, the, uh, the empty accounts are gonna be cleared out and for some time the state will shrink back to uh, the point where you actually can stick, uh, store the whole thing in memory. But practically speaking, as the number of users increases and as the number of users increases right up to the limits of the system, the state is going to grow and the state realistically is going to grow to the point where like on mo the computer, on any kind of consumer hardware, you're going to be hitting disk. Basically like almost every time that you're reading. Now, this is uh, uh, in general, if you do some calculations, so for example, with our uh, a read takes about 200 microseconds, 
then if you assume five or 10 reads uh, per transaction, that goes up to a millisecond. Then if you, assume, if you realize that reading or processing transactions should not take up more than about 10% of the time, then that basically means that you have a, a limit of around 100 transactions a second. So it's clear that there are theoretical limits to how fast blockchains can scale. And basically somewhere between 50 to 200, uh, 200 transactions a second seems like a uh, kind of close to, a ma close to the theoretical maximum, like after optimizing for one shard. Now, there are basically there's two sort of well there's okay there's three paradigms for moving for increasing scalability of blockchains. One of them is to change the trade-offs and to say that basically there should be fewer like the size of one shard should be larger and uh, the uh, fewer people should run full nodes and more people should run like clients. The second approach is uh, is channels and the third approach is sharding. Now it turns out the second and the third do both have, both have issues of their own. So here's one interesting uh, sort of challenge with channels. And I feel, so in general, I feel like one of the main lessons of the uh, DOS attacks is that in the case of fairly complex systems, a lot of the most, uh, a lot of the most difficult attacks to, re to come up with, to realize and to deal with, are attacks that have to do with combinations of various properties of your system. So, and particularly in situations where you're relying on assumptions that are normally the case, but in some cases you actually end up relying on even, uh, even stronger assumptions without realizing it. So, I, uh, uh, one, so in general, channels are a subclass of this general class of technologies that relies on interactive verification. So this is the principle that we're not going to calculate the answer on chain, but we're going to let, di we're gonna let like, different people provide what they think the answer is. And if one of them decides to cheat by providing the wrong answer, well, the other person can contradict them. And there is some protocol on chain that does some kind of adjudication. And as long as there's at least one honest participant, the honest participant's answer kind of defeats all the other ones. Now, this is nice. But this actually does strengthen the assumptions that you have on the protocol, because it relies on the protocol to not just be safe, but so to not just like not do things that are invalid, but to also be live. So if, for example, you have an interactive protocol and the challenge period of this interactive protocol so is let's say one hour. So let's say if uh, A does something and let's say if B, if A provides the wrong answer, then B has one hour to one hour to challenge it. Well, if you can shut off the blockchain for an hour, then you can basically override the entire mechanism and A can get away with, with whatever they want. So this is bad. So basically what this means is that if you want to have channel technologies, number one, you want to make sure that the backbone is, is, uh, is strong, both against stop, both against the doing things that it shouldn't do and against uh, attacks that make it not do things that it should do. Here's another interesting one. So let's get, suppose you have an environment where everybody uses channels. Yay, channels exclusively, they win, everyone uses them. So let's say 50% of transactions open channels, 50% of transactions close them. We'll assume blocks are two thirds full. And let's say channels on average last 100 days and they have a two day challenge period. All of decent assumptions seem reasonable. Now let's say on average, one so what this means is that on average, 1% of channels close per day because they last 100 days. But on average, only a third of the, of the blocks is dedicated to closing channels, so theoretically it can go up to 3%. So let's suppose that you as an attacker, maybe you hacked an exchange, maybe you are the Bitfinex hacker, and you're interested in doing something a bit more fun than accepting Bitfinex's latest attempt to negotiate with you. Then uh, here's what you can, let's say you as an attacker decide you are going to control 8% of all channels. So here's what you do. Number one, you send pre-play attacks. So basically you try to provide wrong answers to all channels at the same time. Now the problem is, well, guess what? These channels have, there's a, the challenge period is two days. During each day, 3%, only 3% of channels can close. 3% times two is 6%. And 6% is only 75% of 8%. So only 75% of the victims can challenge in time. And because every victim really wants to challenge, really wants to be sure that their money is safe, they're going to fight to outbid each other to do so. They're all going to be willing to pay very high transaction fees, potentially like large percentages of, their entire, of uh, all the funds that they have in these channels. And in the other 25 cases, you might be able to get away with stealing some money. 
there are ways to mitigate this. So one approach that we've been, uh, that like Jeff Coleman and I with, were uh, thinking about in the context of Ethereum is on-chain triggers. So basically you can have channel contracts to try and check and see are there many being channels that are being closed at the same time? And if there are, maybe they automatically extend the challenge period. Maybe C used block gas used as a trigger. So if blocks are full, once again, extend the challenge period more. Heavily penalize malicious pre-closing. So if a user tries to maliciously close a channel with wrong information and they get caught, penalize them even more. So there are things that you can do. But the point is, you have to realize that these kinds of issues exist, and you have to realize that you might need to be, have a strategy for dealing with them. Because if you don't, then eventually the system is going to kind of run off on its own, and eventually parameters might be different from what you expected, and the system might be in this sort of dynamic state where all of a sudden it can't sort of safely, like it, there, it, it can't safely collapse anymore. So I tax channels a bit. Let me, I'll, I'll attack my own mechanism a bit, sharding. So transaction capacity of one shard. With Ethereum right now, let's say it's 15 transactions a second. Transaction capacity of 80 shards. Well, 15 times 80 is like totally some, uh, some weird number between 1,199 and 1,201 that I can't tell you right now. Um, but for each individual, even though the entire system can handle 12, 1,200 transactions a second, each individual shard can still only handle 15 transactions a second. And so if he wants to do a targeted attack, if you want to do an attack that's targeted at raising gas prices within one shard, then you can still do it. And it's actually not even more expensive than it is right now. So this is important because um, it does mean that even though in the normal case, Sharding means you can process 80 times more. It doesn't mean that these kinds of if you well, we'll say it this way: if you expand supply by if you can expand your transaction capacity by a factor of 80, then one of the consequences is that transaction fees are going to go down a lot. But the problem is that you can't you can't rely on the transaction fees being at those new lower levels because if you rely on transaction fees being at those very low levels. Then it turns out that, well, an attacker can use an hour service attacks to push transaction fees right back up to somewhere fairly close to where they would be if sharding did not exist, to, at least temporarily by spending a lot of money. So one way you can, now one way some, you might consider solving it is by doing some kind of like automatic load balancing. So if people send lots of transactions, try to like automatically distribute them between shards. Sometimes this works, but sometimes this can't. And the reason is that basically Amdahl's law, which basically states, well, that there's some stuff that you just can't, par can't parallelize. And for, even for applications that you, where, you, where you can parallelize some parts, or the part of, uh, pretty quickly the parts that can't, be parallel, that can't be parallelized become dominant. So automatic load balancing doesn't work. So in general, a lot of applications, even applications sitting on top of scalable blockchains, are themselves not going to be scalable, and they themselves are still going to be just as vulnerable to attacks that are trying to push the tr transaction fees up as they were before. So there we go. So these are ba basically interesting stuff to think about. And um, hopefully we will uh, say in, I'll also say that I'm uh, definitely glad that um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these issues have come up now. Now, since uh, while all, while both Ethereum and applications on top of it, and like various kinds of protocols on top of it, are still are still fairly new, because I mean, practically speaking, we really should have these. Uh, have, a, have as solid an understanding of, the, of uh, these things as we can. And if, if there needs to be adjustments to the base protocol, then we should do them. If there needs to be adjustments to how applications work, we should do them before uh, the uh, extremely uh, um, high levels of scaling start to actually happen. So thank you. It sounds like it. It's very slow to communicate between shards. There are actually ways to accelerate communication. Mm -hmm. So um, 
One example is there's this notion of that you, like you can make promises that are backed by deposits. So you can, make, you can potentially have like an, uh, a sort of protocol on top that says, if you think that like some particular message got committed within 30 seconds, you can basically say, I promise that this is true. And if you later show to me that it doesn't, then I agree to lose like some amount of ether. Mm -hmm. And so there are, uh, like, there are ways to get around it in some cases. Uh, so is that, I mean, is that sufficient? If you have like a protocol level contract, which mm -hmm. is accessed by 80% of contracts on, on the other shards, right. is that sufficient to handle that? Um, it depends. So in general, like if you have an application, uh, if you have a contract that everything on every other shard needs to interact with, then I'd probably recommend seeing if you can basically try and structure the application in such a way that it has sort of has a piece on every shard. Um. <clears throat> Uh, please. Uh, hi, I have two questions. Uh, one is, sh is the sharding d done in any deterministic way, or can any transaction go to any shard? So sh think of shards as being kind of subsets of address space. So basically, think of them as being kind of like these sort of islands, or in my previous analogy, the sort of countries inside of the EU, when they have their own sort of sets of contracts inside of them, and their own sets of accounts. So it's, it's sharded by the originating Yeah, contract? it's sharded by basically yeah, contracts and by accounts. And transactions specify which shard they sort of oper they are supposed to go into. All right, thanks. And the other question is, why is there a holding period when a validator pulls out of the pool? Um, so the reason is uh, for that is to get around um, in uh, w what I call a long range attacks. So the concern here basically is that uh, like you have in Casper, like you have this concept of penalization, which prevents people from uh, doing this, uh, like mining on every or validating on every chain at the same time. But then the, the pr one problem with that is that well, if a validator could withdraw and the, or and then after withdrawing on the main chain, then vo then uh, vote on all the other chains. And so like this potentially could also sort of break, uh, break a lot of incentives. And so the solution is that we require the like, validators ether to be deposited for a very long time so that if once a validator does withdraw, like the, all the other chains are already four months behind.